peoples. And they did that as well, but another thing that we're doing is we're coming back to declare his marvelous works amongst this group of people. Amen. Um, I'm going to let them come up here in just a moment, but first I would like to say this. Uh, out of all the groups I've been with, and most of the time I just travel by myself, but uh, out of any group that, I've, that I have been with, uh, in all my time of going with churches places, this group right here was just spot on used by the Lord. Um, 27 people, uh, we had a brother Richard join us, 28, 28, 29 folks together for seven days. Uh, that has a potential of being hairy sometimes. Um, sleeping in the bunk houses, you saw the room with a bunch of bunks, that's where you know, you take uh, 15 plus women and put them in one room. A room you can imagine how it's not your home, it's not your way, it's not, you know, uh, it's not your showers that you're stepping into, and uh, it's definitely different. Um, fellas were the exact same way, right? Um, it was, it was something special. It really was. But. The, the, the wonderful, wonderful thing as a pastor is I never one time had to pull anyone aside and say, brother, you said that wrong and it hurt the feelings. Can you go apologize? Or sister, that didn't sound too, too Christ-like in the moment. Never once did I have to play a referee. Everybody understood the moment and the arena that we were in. Everybody understands that we're new creatures. Amen? And... Uh, as a matter of fact, that's one thing when we first went down there. Every morning we had devotion, and the first devotion I took, every other morning other people did the devotions. But in the first devotion, I let them know this is going to be different living with a group of people, and you have to remind them and yourself that they are a new creature, and so are you. Amen? And so we heard that, we heard that saying quite a bit over the past seven days, that we're new creatures in Christ, and thank God that we are. Amen? Uh, so... I've got so much that I could share, but I'm just going to get out of the way and hope they share it all. And uh, whatever they don't, maybe I'll just kind of clean up and add it at the end. Um, but I definitely, and that was my goal on this trip, was to kind of stay removed as much as I could, let other people do the devotions, let other people lead in prayer. Uh, I did preach three or four times maybe at services, but it was great seeing the altar calls come forward and this team of people right here come forward and lay hands on people and pray. Our young people laying hands on people and praying for people. The Spirit of God just moving in the moment. And these people that you sent forward last week did an amazing job through Christ. Amen? So I'm just thankful for that. Amen. Uh, Eric, would you come up and share a little bit? What I'm going to ask you to do, Brother Eric, is share what the Lord showed you uh, on this trip. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Probably don't need this microphone because the Lord yeah, gave me a loud voice. Some of that elder. Oh, okay. I'll use it then. <laughs> my eyes were opening up in so many ways, and throughout the week, I wondered what my purpose was that was there. And the Waymaker song that came on this morning reminded me something, that he's a promise keeper. And I remembered a prayer that I prayed a long time ago once I came home from all that I went through, through all the addictions and the jail and everything else. And I asked him when I started paying attention and seeing all the blessings that I had before me, before my family and my loved ones and my friends. And he reminded me that this week, like Lee, I kind of sat back and I watched everybody and I was able to take everything in and see all the blessings that were just before me in so many different ways and through so many people. I watched everybody, the, I watched the Lord supply everybody with everything. I watched the teenagers, how they went out of their way for the young ones, how they went out of their way for the people who needed prayer and needed hands to be laid on them and be prayed for. I watched people step up that aren't normal, that wouldn't normally step up. I watched a young lady one evening with fear over her face and the next morning in front of I don't know, there was a hundred or more people at the hospital and she just, the spirit hit her and she stepped up with boldness like 
unless you were there and experienced it, you wouldn't understand. And I was standing right next to her, and just the anointing that came off of her on me and washed me and hit me, it was, it was so awesome. To see how these people praise and worship made me realize I am not praising and worshiping the way that I should be. These people, the young ladies and with the tambourines in one of the services we had one of the last nights, to watch them just be in sync with the Lord and with the songs and with the praise and the worship and see how these people, how they live and the, the poverty and stuff and still see smiles on their faces, even going through what they're going through and made me realize that I am a spoiled man here in America. I don't deserve a thing that I have. I have a, a nice warm bed, soft to lay in. I have running water, hot and cold, as I choose to use it. I have food, and that right there, just having the food, the leftovers that will sit in the refrigerator for days, and then we throw it away, or food that rots, you know, sitting out or whatever. And these people, a lot of these people don't know when their next meal is going to come from or where it's going to come from, much less clean water. They don't have clean water in most of these places. But still see the smiles on their faces and see that when the healing be begins in their lives and the salvation that comes to some of those people through all of this, it was such an eye-opening experience. And I realized the promise that the Lord made to me a long time ago when I asked him to show me all the blessings. He showed me so many blessings. I don't have enough time to sit up here and share with y'all everything that I've seen. But all that I did see, and it was just, it, it's, uh, it's impossible for me to explain and for me to not have words is going to say something. <laughs> but I've seen everybody, and I'm so thankful that I've seen all the blessings working through the Lord. Michelle as a mouthpiece to these people, being able to translate from us to them when needed be, and the others that translated and helped, the people that stepped up at different times. I watched, where's Brother Brent? I don't mean to call you out, but I watched him work with some of the children and stuff, and I've known Brent for a little while now, and I never knew he had this blessing, but to see, there was a picture up here when he was holding one of the children and the smile on that child's face and on him and watching him work, even behind the scenes with us, it was with Magnus and some of the other children and other the teenagers and stuff, it was so awesome to be able to step back and just look out in front of me and start to count the blessings. And like Lee said this morning, I wish I had taken a notebook and a pen and a pad and just started to write stuff down so that I would never forget it. And I've prayed again this morning that the Lord never lets me forget what I've seen and what I've been able to, to testify for. My blessings that I have in front of me are so numerous and so many. Coming from what I come from, I don't deserve it. And I know that's where mercy and grace comes in. I have a grandchild on the way. The Lord, amen, praise the Lord for that. When I was spending my time in jail, the Lord gave me a word through Ezekiel. And he said, I will do better to you in the end than I did in the beginning. And he is, even though I fail daily, he is consistently a promise keeper. He is consistently keeping to those promises. He is a way maker. To watch him do what he did in Mexico through each and every one of us, not just me, Brother Lee, and, and everything, when the Spirit falls, I'm telling you, it's so heavy this morning. I had to get up here and get on my knees because it was pushing down so hard on me. I was about to fall on my knees right there. And I mean literally fall. It was just so heavy on me. Just all the blessings that we all have. And I want to invite each and every one of you, if you ever get a chance to go on a missions trip, whether it's Mexico or somewhere else, and I'd like to go to other places too to be able to help and do things. For a long time, the Lord has made me a person that I like to help people and to bless people and to do things, work and fix things and things like that. And I want more of that, even more so now that my eyes have been opened. But I invite each and every one of us, we're called to help people. And maybe it's not the missions field, maybe it's locally or it's just somebody you know or any way. Do it if you can. And if, if you can and if you ever get a chance to go on a missions trip, 
go, because I'm telling you, it's going to change you in ways that you can't even imagine. It will open your eyes and your mind and more so your heart, and you will see the Lord more that I realized at times in my life I have failed to see him. And then through this week, it was just amazing to see everybody and all that everybody put forward. <clears throat> Last thing I'll share with, in the beginning of the week, the Lord gave me two devotions and two different things that I had. And it basically sums up this, an endless supply, supply of all of our needs. And it wasn't until Thursday until I was asked to share. And I knew I was going to be asked, but I didn't know how or when. And it was Thursday morning that I was asked to share on those devotions. And it just goes along with everything on how he supplied every one of our needs. The protection that he gave us, we never had a problem or anything going through. Might have been a little slow going through the bridge or something, but other than that, we didn't have any problems, no issues, nothing broke down, nobody got hurt. In fact, it was the exact opposite. It was just more than we can even share to, to get y'all to grasp it, but I just... I want to thank the Lord and praise Him for all that He's done. Amen. 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 For those that don't know, this is Brittany. Everybody say hello, Brittany. Hello. Share what uh, you saw the Lord do on the trip. Um, that stood out to you. Is this good? Right here? Right here? Farther? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, so this is probably, I think, this is my third time going on a mission trip there. And each time I've gone, I've seen different things happen. But each time I've gone, I've also seen the Lord move in every way possible. So um, this is a different group that I've gone with. <laughs> but I love each one of them. And it was a long week with <laughs> having busy days and stuff planned every day. But um, I can't say I have a favorite day. I have favorite moments from each of the days that we were there. And um, the kids, we had VBS for them, and it was great interacting with them and, uh, and seeing the <laughs> adults also and interacting with them in different ways. And uh, everywhere we went, there was new places that I hadn't been to. And everywhere we went, you could see each seed that had already been planted and that our people in our team had planted while we were there. And it was, it was nice seeing that. And, um, you know, not only did we change people's lives that we witnessed to, but we also saw things change in the lives of the missionaries that we were with. And we saw things fall in line each day with the people that were in our group and the people that we went and witnessed to there in Mexico. And... Um, it was a huge blessing <laughs> to see things fall in line with the Lord and how he works. And um, I am not a very <laughs> person, I'm not a person to talk in front of a lot of people. And I was put on the spot a few times to pray. <laughs> and it, it puts you out of your comfort zone, but it's good. It's a good way to come out of your comfort zone. And um, so I guess you can say the Lord, he was, he worked in my life <laughs> too a lot this week even to put me up here in front of y'all telling about it. <laughs> so, but, um, I mean, it was a great trip. And, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Sierra, did you want to share? Yeah. See, no? <laughs> um... The amount of blessings that I saw were not only simple, but they were also advanced. Seeing the joy that came from the kids that may not deserve what they have, they don't have anything. And to see what they go through and what they live with, and to just see the smiles and laughter on their faces just only puts a new spark of joy and love and I can't even find my words. Um, it 
it really showed me how spoiled I am to see the kids and the adults and the teenagers there, what they go through and what they've lived through and what they have and what they don't have only puts a new respect into my life and soul. It completely changed my life and my thoughts and just everything. Um, I mean, there were moments where they didn't have anything and to just know that I have everything that I need and more just to know that God has blessed me with the stuff they do have. God is so amazing. Who, who in this team wants to share what the Lord did at the hospital? Someone that stepped back and was able to see it. Who, who, who was stepped back? Arlene. All right, first of all, say a prayer that I get through this. I had so many stories that I wanted to give today, so I wrote part down. But then when the first song, showing the people, and that they could feel the love of God in their heart. So at the hospital, I mean, there were just people everywhere just waiting for news of their loved ones that were in some sitting what was it 15 days yeah. 15 days just sitting outside waiting just for news and you know, there's no food there's no water they're just so here we come and just the looks on their face you could just see like a peace come over them and when JC got up to do her testimony and to see people just pulling out their phones and just mesmerized by her message and men sitting there just starting to cry because of her story and they knew here is hope. And we handed out food and, and water and, and to bless them with that. So the heartache came with there were more people there than we expected. And I went down, you know, handing out sandwiches and, and water, and I get to the end of my line, and there's two more people. And I come back to get more, and there's nothing more to give. And to think I've got to go back and say, you know, I have nothing left to give you. That was heart-wrenching. And then when Brother Mark put his hand on me and said, now it's time to go bless somebody and pray. And it's like, okay, I don't even pray when I help with eight, eight and nine-year-olds. It's like, and you're asking me to go pray with an adult. It's just, you talk about out of your comfort zone, that was it. And I wanted to hesitate. And I'm looking around, it's like, okay, I don't have an interpreter. So it's like, thank you, Lord, because I'm on my own. And when I hear a lot of y'all pray, it is so beautiful and so eloquent. I stumble with my prayers at night just for myself, and I'm thinking, how am I going to do this for somebody else? But when I realized it, they didn't have to understand what I was saying. And I'm just looking up and down the line. There was one woman, for whatever reason, that I was so drawn to. And when I stood in front of her and put my hand on her shoulder and started to pray, she just grabbed me and just held on and just cried. So we prayed together and we cried together and neither one of us knew what the other one was saying. And then I walked off to pray with another. And when I came back by her, she grabbed me again. So we went through it again. And it was finally time for us to pack up and leave. We'd done what we could. She grabbed me the third time and just held on and bawled. So like the song said, she felt God in her heart. And like I say, we didn't need anything else, just the love of God settling over us 
and brought peace to both of us. We showed up. We showed up to that hospital unannounced, and uh, they don't have room on the inside for people to wait. They wait outside, like she said, for weeks. Um, the care there is a lot like the care in Canada. Uh, maybe the youngest get seen first. The elderly have to wait because maybe the hospital's so full that to them, your life's not as important as an elderly person, as a young person who's got a whole life ahead of them. Very sad. Uh, the doctors do not communicate well with the family, and so some of them had family that had been inside for weeks, and they still did not know what was happening to their daughters, to their mothers, to their fathers, their loved ones, and you can imagine sitting out there, and they will not leave the entrance of that emergency room uh, because their fear is if I leave and the doctor comes to look for me, that's my moment that I may miss. And so they find a spot on the concrete, and they sit or they stand or they lay there, and they just hold out as long as they can. And all the while, ambulances are coming, and everybody's got to move and get out the way, and the sick are posted out of the ambulance and taken through everybody. Brother Kyle had uh, an experience with the ambulance. Kyle, I want you to come share that while we were preaching there at the hospital. Praise the Lord. Morning, everybody. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the image of the week. There, there were a lot of things. A lot of other folks are going to be talking about things, and... Um, it's it, for those of you. How many? How many are here today who have been in a in, in a Mexico mission in previous years? Could you please raise your hand if you've been to Me no? If you're not talking about the current group, but if you've been to Mexico before, could you please raise your hands? One, two, three, four. Yeah, I'm talking about people other than the people who were in our, yeah, in, our yeah, in the yeah. group this year. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hey, we got a, we got a bunch. We got a bunch. Nine. So you understand a little bit about what's going on here. Um, we, live, we live in a world that um, we, we don't truly understand as Americans. A, a lot of the things that we experience in our lives, um, quite frankly, are self-inflicted. A, a, a lot of the things we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis are, are because of decisions that we made and, and were not necessarily good ones. The folks that are in Matamoros, and, and we saw it, we met them in the fishing village, we met them at the soup kitchen, we met them at the children's home. These are people who, who quite frankly, didn't have a lot of choices in how they're, they're turned out. These are people who are genuinely in need of help. And the image that was burned into my mind for the entire trip occurred when we were at the emergency room, we were handing out food, um, I will tell you, it's a very desperate child who takes a piece of candy from somebody who looks like me. Okay, we were we were handing out food, and and at 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 a point, I had run out of food to give the kids, and I was just going around working the crowd, shaking hands, praying for people, blessing people, and an ambulance pulled up, and and these are ambulances. These these are guys who drive like maniacs, and like literally, people are having to like move very smartly to get out of the way of the ambulance as it pulls in. And as I'm working the crowd, the ambulance had to come to a stop because the drivers realized that, there, that people weren't getting out of the way fast enough. And, and I turn to dodge the ambulance, and the window of the ambulance slides open, and an arm just comes out the window. From the back. From, from behind. This was, this was the guest of honor in the ambulance. And the arm comes out, just reaching out, and I grabbed it and I prayed. There are people out there, not just Metamoros, Mexico, not just Los Fresnos, Texas, there are people in Amelia County whose spiritual state is that desperate. They are reaching out the window right now. Who is going to grab their hand and go alongside them and pray? The, uh, the scripture that came to me really quickly with regard not just to what we experienced at the hospital, but for the entire week, was Matthew 10, 10, 40. We're going to read 10, 40 through 42. It said, He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, 
And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he, and shall, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Now, I'm not going to say that we ought to be out doing good things so that we can rack up bonus points with Jesus. But he says those things in Matthew 10 because that's what he finds important. And when we were out there, uh, Arlene, Arlene spoke very eloquently to what I'm about to describe, and I'm going to try not to, to replow that ground. But the teenagers and the youth that were out there this week were doing exactly what I described in Matthew 10. They were preaching God's word, using words occasionally, but they were preaching the gospel by their acts of love. They showed Jesus Christ to people. I want you to think about this. We take for granted so much in our world. Think about these people, these poor folks who are at this hospital or in this village or at this soup kitchen, these children who don't know anything but pain and suffering. And if you all read history, pain and suffering is the normal lot of human existence. We are very spoiled here in America. Okay? How many of you all know what's going on in Venezuela right now? Twenty years ago, the people of Venezuela were among the most prosperous people in Latin America. Hydroelectric power provided 80% of their electricity. They have the largest oil reserves in the world. They have a huge amount of arable land. Their, their climate can grow nearly anything. Those people right now are breaking into their national zoo and eating the animals on display. They, if you go to the hospital in Venezuela, you'd better bring your own antibiotics and, and your own IV fluid. These people are starving to death because 20 years ago, they voted to make government their god. We are that close in America. And when I was standing out that, outside that hospital and when we were walking around that, the, the outskirts of Matamoros looking at the devastation, our country is that close. We don't see it today, but I'm going to tell you, in 1999, the people of Venezuela didn't see it either. And, and I'm not going to make this a political speech. Politics are downstream of culture. Culture is downstream of religion. If you make bad decisions about the God that you will worship, it will eventually hit you everywhere else. Yeah, that's right. The biggest thing we can do, I'm not saying who to vote for. That's not where I'm going. But if we take our relationship with Jesus Christ seriously, we need to be prepared today to be the salt and the light in our communities. It is not enough for us to come back from this trip to Mexico fired up and saying that was a great experience and our lives are transformed. We have a community out here right now in Southside, Virginia, that is desperate for Jesus Christ, even if they don't know it. Amen. Amen. And if we fail, if we fail to take the lessons we have learned and apply them right now, woe well unto us. Because we have that information. God has alerted us. God has awakened us. And we have been called to be that salt and that light. Now is the time. Here is the place. Mexico is great. I hope to get back there. But we have a rich mission field right here in Amelia. And at this point, I'm going to hand the mic back to our brother. Hey. Amen. Amen. Anybody else want to share? Hey guys, so public speaking is not my thing. And going into this trip, I had a feeling the brothers were going to call me out. And during our first debriefing, they said, we're going to go to a hospital. And we need someone to share their testimony about healing. As they both looked me right in the eye. They didn't call my name out, but they basically said, you're going to be doing it. So throughout the week, I was nervous and I just kept praying, like, Lord, my testimony is something that I have a hard time with. I have been walking around lacking joy, maybe even almost oppression. It's something that I have a hard time with personally. If you were to come up to me on the street and ask what my scars are, I would excitedly tell you, oh, I had cancer, God healed me, and go through it. But sharing in front of a crowd of people has never been my thing. But this trip, there's healing. This trip gave me healing. Before we went, I would just cry that no one understood what I was going through. 
I just wanted someone that was there with me that knew. So the brothers said, we're going to a hospital. They don't know we're coming. Brother Richard's going to start playing the guitar, and hopefully people will congregate around you. And I'm like, you're going to have me speak in a hospital, and no one's even, like, guaranteed to listen? Like, what's going to happen? So we go up, and we're outside, and ambulances are flying up right at me, and we're dodging ambulances and random trucks. And it was an experience. But God just washed over me. I just began to shake, and I don't even know what I said. What I had planned to say, I didn't say. And I just was making eye contact. And for once, I saw people that understood what I was going through, what I had gone through. And although we might not speak the same language, we were able to see the hurt in each other's eyes. And I was able to give them hope, not through me, but through Jesus. That what got me through can and will get them through if they just surrendered. And as silly as it sounds, this trip taught me that prayer works. You think through my testimony I would know that prayer works, but never seen it happen the minute you pray, it just be delivered. The brothers uh, we were at, where were we? Yesterday when we, the day before yesterday. Metamorphs. Yeah, we were at Morris, and they shared that there was a young girl who had cancer and she was away for surgery and treatment. And they said we would like the Norman family to go to her house where her father and younger siblings are. And we want you to share the, the word of God. The dad is not a believer. And we all looked at each other and we're like, we're going to get him. He's ours. Like, he's going to be God's by the end of this. So we show up to his house and he's not there. We walk through a cow pasture to find him. He's out somewhere with the cows, which for those who know me, you know I love cows and calves. And we have baby calves running around and piglets. And I was totally in my element in Mexico. And we couldn't find him. And Brother Chacha said, we need to stop. I've never been further than here. I don't know the land. I'm uncomfortable taking you guys further. And we were like, no, he's going he's gonna to be God's by the end of this day. We are going after him. So we continued to walk and couldn't find him. So we stopped and we prayed. And we were like, Lord, we know this man is going to be yours. We know that his daughter is going to be healed, but we need to get to him. Just bring him to us. And John stood up and prayed. And the minute we opened our eyes, here comes a cowboy over a hill on a horse with a whip in his hand, waving it over like this, riding straight for us. And it was Jose. And he dedicated his life to Jesus in that moment. Yeah. So I got healing through this trip, and I learned that prayer works when you just receive it and when you believe it and you begin to thank God right after you ask God. They taught me a whole different level of worship there. They taught me a whole different level of hunger and prayer. And yeah, we bring people to the front. And yes, I've been in the person in the front many times. But that hunger that they have, and then they just believe it in that moment as a congregation. Like, we will be back up here. We will be testifying that this person was healed. We will go to God in worship was just amazing, and it taught me a whole nother level. Amen. Amen. Where's John? Where's John? Where's John? John, stand up for a second. Just right there. Everybody say, hey, John. Hey, John. Yeah. <laughs> you can sit down for a minute. Hey, so, like, how cool is that, uh, that they, they go as a group to as far as Brother Chacho's been? Brother Chacho's been doing ministry down there for 21 years, and Chacho says... Okay, now the Mexican in the room says, we got to stop. I don't know, past this bush, and we were in the bush. He says, past this, past this bush, I don't know anything else that's beyond there. We need to stop. And the group said, no, let's pray. We got to find this man. And to be a young teenager in front of a bunch of adults to stand up and lead that prayer, that they would find that man so they could preach the gospel and lead him to Jesus Christ. And then a minute after he says amen, that cowboy comes riding across the field in sight, and they lead him to Jesus. It's just like, how faithful is our God to teach our young people that prayer works? Amen? Amen? Right? So for the rest of their life, everyone that was in that team in that Bush neighborhood, everyone that was in that team will be able to remember that moment and say, just like we studied in Scripture last week, where Jehoshaphat was telling God all that I've seen, God, so I know you can answer this because I've seen you answer this. That group will be able to say, but God, I know that you brought someone who wasn't there there. 
And because of that, I'm believing you in the same faith for the provision in my life today. I'm thankful to God for that. Yeah. Brother Britt, do you want to share? Do you want to share? Um, I guess for me, what I saw and what I felt from the people there is we went and we gave. And I just wish we had more to give to everywhere we went. But they gave to us more than we gave to them. They fed us better than we fed them. And they prayed for us better than we could pray for them. And I didn't see... I saw poverty at the border. I saw poverty at the hospital. But when we were in their homes, I saw wealth. I saw wealth beyond... beyond things. They loved us. They loved each other. just felt like we really didn't even do that much for them. You know, we gave them what we had, but they were so thankful that they blessed us. That was mine. We, we passed shacks and shanties and uh, in America we have tree forts that are wealthier than the homes that families live in. And we buy our children playhouses that look like complexes compared to the homes down there. And as we were riding by, we had to take, we had so many people, we had to take four vehicles every time in and out of Mexico. And I shared with the people in my group that there are millionaires that are lost in this world that don't have a clue that if they could just change places with the homes that we went into and experienced the peace and the power of the Holy Spirit that rested there, they would be willing to switch in a minute for that exchange. And it really was that welcoming. It really was. It really was. Uh, Sister Betty, do you want to share? I just want to say that ever since I've moved to Amelia, I've been planting a garden because I love a garden with beautiful flowers, but the Lord showed me when we were over there that the flowers that he is growing, the people are the most beautiful, and that's what I want to see from now, and I want to see that. And when you say that you come back changed and your life will never be the same, it's even greater than that because what God did when we were over there, it is going to be for eternity, for the kingdom. He changed the kingdom. He changed eternity when we did what he sent us to do because he worked through us to do it. So the holy kingdom for eternity has now been changed. And this is the spirit that we went in. And every time I say me, just put your name in it. And it's not only that we went in it, but it's the spirit that we have to go in to do anything. And we need that. We need that today for what God has here for us or anywhere he will send us. It said, it's um, Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted he has sent me to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting, so that they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Then 
verse, the next verse is then. Then this is what he will do when we do that. Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations. And they will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. God can do that if we will do what God has called us to do. So I just want to say and give all the glory to the Lord because God went ahead of us. God anointed us. He was with us. And it was life-changing. Thank you. I love Sister Betty. She's a humble woman. She is filled with the Spirit of the Lord. And anybody that didn't know that on this trip learned that this week. She hears from the Lord. Uh, we went into the bush, and uh, the bush is an area, one of these uh, places where Brother Mark and Chacho for 21 years never knew existed. And, I mean, they're all over Mexico. That just goes to show how God will keep a door closed until it's time to be open. Recently, and they've been passing this dirt road for so long, and they just never knew what was down it. And recently, they sent a pastor down it. They went in and they evangelized, knocked on the door of a home of a Catholic family. That whole family came to know Christ. And they said, hey, if you want to have a church, you can have it in my front piece of property right here. They take chairs every Sunday. The pastor preaches at one of his churches at 12, and then he goes there in the evening. They set chairs out there in front of the lady's house and have church. And so Friday, that's what we did as a team. We went out to evangelize this Bush neighborhood. I mean, it really is in the bush. Um, beside this woman's home is uh, three parcels of land, and we think parcels is something huge, but it's, it's really not uh, there. Uh, but there were three parcels of land, and um, long story short, uh, God told Sister Betty, uh, basically what happened was Mark and Chacho are looking to purchase those three parcels to build a church right there in the bush. And God told Sister Betty that she was to buy that she was to purchase the land and give it to Mark and Chacho. God gave her a number, and when she called the place, the number was too high, and Sister Betty and Brother Chacho said, no, 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 that's not the number God gave. And God gave us a number, so they shared the number. The people agreed to sell it at the number God gave, and the land is purchased, being purchased for the church. Yep. I mean, just amazing stuff, man. And I know it's already like going on uh, 12, 15 or whatever. So much stuff, so much stuff, so much stuff that we can't, we can't, I mean, you can't get it all out. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Ken Napier's little word's normally 30 minutes. Are we, are we at a little word or a micro word? <laughs> Don't turn the mic off on the brother. <laughs> Bob, in four minutes, hit mute. <laughs> For all those that know Ken, you know I'm loving on him right now, praise the Lord. <laughs> I just was so amazed by, excuse me, all of us seem to have lost our voice a little bit Amen. this week. Amen. But I just want to thank everyone in here. I see what Brother Mark and Chacho are doing down there, and I can tell you, to see the thread that Christ has just woven in everything down there to think that this church has been a part of everything along the way. It's simply amazing. This church and the great people within it, there's trucks down there with 300,000 miles. And if you know those roads down there or ever get a chance to look them up on computer, when a truck down there gets 3,000 miles, that is a miracle. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, I just want to make sure everybody knows that what they have been doing down there, it's growing, it's growing. You couldn't have two better men than, than I, when I see Brother Mark, he just, he astonishes me. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. And uh, Chacho also, but you can just feel that hand of God on Brother Mark so much. He didn't just take us down there. He's got words that would just lift anybody. He's a, he trains people. He trained every one of us. He put us in circumstances that he knew would make us a little bit 
more uncomfortable than what we would typically be when he could have done what he was asking us to do so much easier. And he just, he's, that was a great opportunity to do that. Amen. So I just want people to know that, you know, God is at work. Uh, I think United in Christ started out very humble in 2001. And now they're getting ready to open up places in, I think, what was it, Brazil? Is the newest one coming up. They're moving to India. What they have started, and if you've seen their humility, is just a blessing beyond blessing. Another um, word that I'd like to speak to is just real quick. Uh, a lot of us, I think, were touched by this message. I don't think it's not something that we don't already know. But we were blessed with the message on Friday before we left the following day about our first love. And our first love in Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ, uh, it's something that I always, I always want to strive for. Because I've been to the place where it was deep, deep love for Christ. I kind of drifted a little away from that love in Christ. And then, like I've told people before, a couple years ago, the Lord just, he's just waiting for me all along. He just, you know, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. But in our message on Friday, uh, it was Jesus in Revelations 2 talking to a church. And he says, you know, you do great things. You do many good things. You do everything that I've asked you to do. But all those things are wonderful. But I want you to love me with the love that you had at first. And I would just love for everyone, if you get a chance today or this week, just to meditate on those feelings that you had when you first accepted Jesus Christ. And take it through the weeks and the months. And if it's the only thing you do every day is just meditate on that first love and how good he is to us what he's provided for us, what he will do for us. I just thank God for his mercy, his grace, his love and kindness. And he, he's always just one step away. So if you get a chance, just meditate on that first love. All of us, all of us could use it. And I ask you all these things, please. All right, so um, we're looking at 1220. I know we still got a lot of people that want to share, so please be respectful. Uh, if, even if everybody just took three minutes, we're going to be in here for a lot longer than what probably we ever have been. Uh, so please respect everybody else's time as you too want to share. Uh, anybody in this row that still wants to share? Come on up. Everybody say hi, Rue. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I have a uh, testimony as well as a blessing which I want to share. So 2016, God laid this seed and uh, desire in my heart for missions. I didn't know how it was going to work out, but God made a way. He's a miracle worker, he's a way maker and a promise keeper. Yeah. 2017, he brought me to CFO, still having the desire and shared with few people about my missions. So 2018, December, a lady who was praying for me and my mom said, the spirit of the Lord tells me that you need to go on a mission trip. And under my breath, I just said, I wish CFO does a mission trip. A month later, pastor sends out the text saying he's taking a team to CFO. I said, thank you, Lord. And uh, went on this mission trip, and um, the desire just is growing. And I hope and pray that God blesses this seed that he has put in my heart. And it's a confirmation. Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19, he gave me when I uh, submitted to Jesus and my salvation uh, I was dwelling on my past with idol worship, and he said he's going to make a way in the wilderness and, you know, send out rivers and flourish the wastelands. So that's a confirmation that he's going to do greater things, and I was blessed. And like the saying goes, this trip blessed my socks off. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, stay right here. Stay right here. Stay right here. Yeah, so. You know, uh, she, she's been called to be a missionary. She doesn't know how it's going to happen. I know when I was called to be a pastor, I didn't know how it was going to happen. How many people in this room have been called to do something? You didn't know how it was going to happen, right? But, you know, so 
I, I don't know. You know, this, this may be the first missionary CFO sends out, you know. Uh, but I tell you what we can do. We're, we're going to pray for her that she hears clearly. Amen. Uh, pray for her that she hears clearly. If you're willing to extend your hand this way, we're, we're going to pray right now. Uh, Father, we just lift up our sister in the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ. As, uh, she knows she's been called to mission. She's had multiple confirmations on it to go forth in the mission field. And we pray, Father, that it would be at the right time when the right door opens. And I pray that there would be no false doors, uh, that there would be no tempting doors uh, that are not of you, Father, uh, that the enemy would not be able to tempt her with any uh, false doors. But, Lord, the one door that comes at the appropriate time would be from you. And so we're grateful for that. And, Lord, I pray that she would know it, uh, that those closest to her would know it and help confirm it, and that would it be for your glory, Father. Lord, that there'd be no confusion, but that you would speak clearly. And until that time comes, may you continue to water her, refresh and bless her and anoint her and teach her now in this training process everything that she'll need as she goes and enters through that door in Jesus name and blood everybody said amen and amen 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 anybody else in this section what's that amen Oh, hold on. Let everybody else hear. Let everybody see. But the, when David was anointed, I feel like this is the one. Yeah. Is the okay. light on? Move your hand. Move your hand. When, da <laughs> <laughs> when David was anointed king, he was anointed king, but he didn't walk into that right away. Right. And he spent time before he was actually anointed. And, um, but then when it was time for him to take that kingship, an Amalekite sojourner happened to be with Saul when he was when he killed himself and he brought the crown to David and placed it before his feet or you know maybe not but I don't think that's the right part of the story but he brought it to David at the right time once Saul was dead and even then it was a year and six months before he governed all of Israel amen amen God's time God's time Amen. Okay, so there were so many blessings I could not even begin. I mean, we could be here until tonight if we all spoke of all of our blessings. The one thing um, I'd like to expand on is something that uh, Miss Betty said. She was talking about how um, God went before us, and I think that is something that I could absolutely say stood out above all. And, and like I said, the blessings are great, but God went before us. There were so many times where I watched how God had already aligned the people who were supposed to be there to witness or and to pray for the people that were there. I watched numerous, numerous times. It was just, it was beautiful to stand back. And I could give many, many examples, but of course our time doesn't allow for that. Um, so the one, there were a couple that are, are absolutely just Mm, tear jerking and, and very emotional for me, and, and we're going we're gonna to do this. But um, one of them was at the hospital, and I was able to just be just amazed, and I mean amazed at God, because one of the situations was, first of all, there was a um, father. It was a father, right, Heather? So there was a father there, and his, his daughter... Um, Say this real quick. I don't want to mess up the first part. The daughter what? Had a brain tumor. Okay, so he put Heather right there with that father at that time because that, that's what he needed at that time. Well, then I walked up because I saw Heather just, just in it, I mean, just praying right there in the spirit, and it drew me in, and I walked up at that time. And then that's when I found out his family member, another family member, was there, and she, she also was drawn in, and she came in, and she started to tell me that she was pregnant, and she was waiting for, um, to be seen, and she had already been, had, she's been waiting for, uh, at that point, it was four, four days, she was waiting, and she was having great pain, um, and she was worried that she was not going to be able her baby would not survive is basically her worries. So 
that moment that, that Heather had with that father then turned to a moment that I had because I was able to tell her that Sierra was not supposed to make it. The doctors had already warned Eric and I, Sierra would not survive this, or the pregnancy. And I remember I, I was bedridden to the point where I could not even, um, I couldn't even go upstairs to my bedroom. My bedroom was moved downstairs. I couldn't hold my newborn baby, which I already had with, with Eric Jr. And she was literally falling from me. So I remember uh, it was um, March 29th, 2001. I remember opening my Bible, and I opened it to Mark. And that verse, 534, on how it says, Daughter, you are healed by your faith. And I claimed that. I claimed that that night that, I, that she was healed, that I was healed by my faith. And we went back to the doctor uh, it was, I think, three or four days later after that. And Dr. Hyde looked at the ultrasounds. He looked at me and he said, I don't know how to explain it, but you've got a completely normal pregnancy. Amen. And I had, so in this, oh, that's not good, like, in this, so here I am praying with that mom, and I have my daughter that was literally at the, the, the baby of this woman. And she was praying over the baby, knelt down, and I looked at the mom and I said, that's my daughter, 17 years later, praying over your daughter. So. Amen. Amen. Anybody else over here? Hello. March, uh, no, November 13th, 1998, um, Chacho was going into a bar. Mark was out on the street evangelizing, and he saw Chacho before he went in, and he reached out to him. He, Chacho accepted salvation, and immediately God started revealing the plan to him. That's where United in Christ started. They have done 50 projects within the United States and Mexico. Now they're in Israel, India, and Brazil. Brazil. So they they have through the through Christ they have this when you plant seeds in United in Christ, you see where it goes. You you see the fruits. Uh we went to Casa de Amor, which is the orphanage. Uh Tim and I have been there um a couple times and we I was able to see Casa de Amor grow. I was able to see they since then they have a church, Iglesia Casa uh Iglesia Casa de Amor which is like a hop, skip, and a jump beside there. And it's just anointed. The whole place is anointed. They've got the soup kitchen we were able to serve at, and we were able to play with the children and do um, a Bible time there. And uh, Miss Betty reached out and um, spoke to the mothers, which was great at the soup kitchen. Also, there's a drug rehab. I just wanted y'all to know, like, what is being sowed into this ministry. It is absolutely phenomenal. Um, just the anointing of just going on the Holy Land there in Los Fresnos, Texas. Just the church itself is just anointed. They're building more dorms. Um, and we, if I'm not mistaken, didn't we raise money for a transformer in Casa de Amor? Yes. We raised money several years ago to do a transformer at Casa de Amor. So we've got to see that. Not to mention at the drug rehab, we, we also um, built two classrooms. So this church has sowed into it. Individuals in this church have sowed into this ministry. Um, I want to really shout out to the, the youth. The youth did an amazing job. Y'all did an amazing I saw each and every one of y'all love on these babies. And, and the kids were sweaty and nasty. And they didn't even care. They had them on their backs. They had them, and I don't know if you saw, noticed in the pictures, but our kids and those kids were glowing. They were glowing, glowing with Jesus. And I'm telling you, I'm so proud of y'all. I'm so proud of each and every one of y'all. Y'all did an amazing job. Amen. Yeah, uh, for those that know a little bit about the Love Homes, it's an orphanage that comes in. Uh, so beside the orphanage, they're, uh, they're now getting ready to build a uh, home for elderly uh, right beside that. And so those are going to be called Homes for Hope. And so the children who have been abandoned will be with the elderly that have been abandoned. And the children will be able to grow from the elderly, and the elderly will be a blessing to the children. 
so, I mean, just these, what these guys do is amazing. Uh, anybody else over here? Anybody else after her, just so I know? Amen. All right, we got two more, and then we'll close. Take this one. Thank you. Um, the second day that we were there was our first day going into Mexico. We had worship, and the Lord just really just slammed into my heart um, everything that my family has walked through through our daughter's cancer as a whole unit he was going to use for one person. Um, and so my word to you is that when you're walking through the fiery furnace of life and you're walking in that affliction, Whatever God has put before your path, walk in it in joy and praise his name through the tears and the heartache and the pain and the hurt and the suffering. Give him thanks and give him glory in that because when you do that, he's going to continue to use you. And that's why one surgery doesn't work, two surgeries doesn't work, three, four, whatever it is because he's using you. And when you're obedient to walk in that, mm, I was the crier of the week, and that's okay, because it's because the light of God's face literally shone upon us all week. When you walk in what he calls you to walk in, he will drop you in a cow pasture, standing in manure, and have a man ride over a hill on a white horse with a whip who has closed himself completely off to the word of God, wants nothing to do with salvation. He's angry, in fact, angry at God. And he will put you in front of that person. And when you lock eyes with what your calling and your situation and your tribulation was, it comes full circle. And there, it, it makes every bit of it worth it. There is nothing more beautiful than that moment when you lock eyes and you just know you know that you know that you know that your family was created, as Esther says, for such a time as this. And so whatever you're going through, I encourage you, ask the Lord, how can he use it to glorify his name for someone else? Because when he does that, it puts a fire inside of you and a power inside of you. It just makes it just so worth it. Um, and the word that the Lord gave me Tuesday morning um, was this. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And he uses us. God uses us for what he sends us for. And so be obedient to be his hands and to be his feet. Um, and the second thing I have to say is that um, our pastor, y'all, you would be so proud of our pastor. We take... We... We take advantage, we take advantage of what we've been blessed with here because it's our norm. Um, our pastor seeks the face of God. He hears from God, as he says Miss Betty does. We watched him as a team. His message changed to deliver to people there who were leaving the ministry. The message kept them in the ministry. Time and time again, we watched our pastor. Pray for your pastor. He works hard on his knees and on his face. Pray for his his family, the wife, his sons that are his backbone other, underneath of God, of course, that hold him up because this is a godly man. And when you see the people there hear him preach, they are blown away by it. And it's not to give him glory. It's to give God the glory for speaking through our pastor. Pray, you guys, pray for our pastor to watch um, my brother step into his calling and preach internationally and to see that was such a gift to me. Um, but with that comes work. And so pray for him and pray for Erica and Elijah and Josiah because um, they need it. They need it. I'm not, I'm not going to share a whole lot of what happened with me personally yet. Uh, I'll share that later, but you remember Brother Dorsey was here a while back and he slapped his hands and said, 
the doors open, the doors coming open internationally. Uh, someone prophesied over me at the end of a service when everybody from our team, but maybe two or three people were left. And the uh, person spoke a word that had been spoken over me before, but this time the doors opened. And so please keep me in prayer. I've got opportunities to, to, to go preach in Brazil, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Israel. And, uh, and I'm going to take those. I'm going to take those opportunities as the Lord says go. I've got to. That's my call is to go international. Uh, in that, my prayer is, is that uh, uh, I'm going to begin to raise up men in the church here under the authority of God to teach uh, teach how to do different things within the church, teach how to do different parts and aspects of the ministry, teach how to preach, teach how to evangelize and get a core group around me so that when I do have to go, everything here is entrusted exactly the way that God wants it could, could to continue to go. Uh, but obviously, uh, with children at home and a wife at home, uh, I'm still listening to only go when God says go. Uh, one thing that uh, Billy Graham said that just blew me away the most uh, just about out of everything he said, he said, I wish I wouldn't have gone as many times that I'd gone. So many doors were opening. We walked through doors without praying on what doors to go through. We just went through any and every open door. I don't want to do that. I want to go through just the door that God says go through. Amen. Amen. And so please pray for wisdom. Please pray for wisdom. Uh, Brother Harrison, come on up. What I can say is, wow, <laughs> it was an amazing trip. Uh, but if any of you need or want a spiritual revival then go on a mission trip because it is really uh, like Brent said you receive so much more from the people that you minister to than than they'll receive so it was just a great great trip Amen. in this room. Um, I don't know if anyone in here is like stagnant in their faith, but going into this trip, um, probably up until about this moment last week, I know that I was for a minute. And um, I don't know if y'all remember we were standing up here last week and they were praying over us, but when Lee walked past me and he anointed me with oil and he laid his hand on my forehead, I had been praying, you know, Lord, I pray that I could be a blessing to someone else this week like you me. And I knew that in that minute, the Lord said, you're going on this trip to bless other people, but I'm really sending you because you need it. This is what you need right now. And, um, He gave me a he gave me a word for the week, and that um that word was fresh, and I didn't really know. I was like, Lord, what is this word? What is this word? Fresh, just fresh, just kept coming to my head. Just fresh, fresh, fresh. And I was like, What does this mean? I don't know what this means. And um, there was this one night where um, Brother Richard Overby and Lee started doing worship in our room or in the sanctuary. And there was probably like five or six of us in there. And we were just worshiping. Late, yeah, late. It's like we did it until like 2 a.m. probably. And I, um, I was just there. Just the spirit of the Lord it just fell upon me, and it was it was so good, y'all. If, if every day could be like that, I would I would do that forever. But the the Lord just told me, you know what? Every day can be like that. Everyone, I get so caught up in social media and what other people think and everything, but you know what? None of that matters, guys. You know what I mean? Do you feel me? Like, God was just like, you know, seek me and seek my face eagerly in everything that you do, and I will show you my way. I will show you my heart, and you know what? I will show up every day like that if that is what you seek. Mm, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Can I share a scripture? Yep. A scripture that the Lord gave me and says, 
So now I have come to come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. And in that, you know, I just stand in faith with that. If you seek the Lord, he will come and find you. He's there waiting for you. You just have to be there seeking his face, and he will show himself to you. Mm. Glory. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I remind you of what I said a week ago when uh, I shared with you all that my bride had asked me, why are you going on a trip to Mexico in August? I said, I don't know yet, but we're going to find out what God wants. And, uh, quickly, two things that I found out. Um, number one, between 30 or 40 people got saved that we know of, and that, that was worth it right there, amen? I mean, that was worth it right there. Uh, the hunger, the call of God when you present salvation. Thank you. Love you, brother. The, the hunger for, for salvation there, it's just so easy to preach. So easy to preach. There's power in the gospel, we know that, but they're so, they are so hungry for that power. Uh, the first message the Lord specifically had me preach um, was about not giving up and being, being all in. And I had no idea that uh, one of my favorite pastors down there was considering quitting because of things that the enemy has put against his family. They had no idea, but the message was directly for him that he was able to stand before his congregation and say, I'm not going anywhere. God told me to stay through this service. Yeah. So part of this trip, why did we go in August? Part of this trip kept that church together. Part of this trip kept that pastor in his congregation. You know, so grateful to God for that. I think it was Thursday, the Holy Spirit woke me up at 5.30. And that's early when you're not going to bed till 1 or 2. <laughs> Depending on who we were, certain people stayed up later and later and did different things. And uh, As I woke up, I saw Brother Richard Overby walking down the dorm, and he opened the door quietly and walked out. And I said, well, I'm going to go out there and see what he's doing. And, we find ourselves in the school of missions there on the campus where we, st where we stayed. They call it base, home base or whatever. And we go in there and we worship for about two and a half hours in spirit and truth. Man, it was, it was beautiful. Just uh, Richard, myself, and the Holy Spirit. The people began to trickle in later as they're coming for breakfast and join us in this worship time. But when we had just started, I looked at Brother Richard and I said, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said that uh, when we go to where we're going today, that Someone is asking God, where are you in this? And that day, we were going on the Mexican side of the border where the refugees end up from Guatemala, Nicaragua, Puerto Rico, Peru, and three or four other places. And when you go to this place, they've set up tents and they're sleeping in these tents. That's what you saw when you saw the tents. They're seeking asylum to come into the U.S. because of what's so bad in their countries where they come from. A lot of what we see on the news are not even Mexicans trying to come across the border. As a matter of fact, the Mexicans are upset that the Nicaraguans, the Puerto Ricans, the people from Peru are coming into their, into their place, into their country. And what I've learned is, as a people, that we, we, we can get this hatred, we can get this anger of saying, stay over there, don't come in here. You know, those Mexican people, and they're not even Mexican. And you see how Satan will take a lie and just... And what I learned is, if you knew what that mom was running from, you'd run too. If you knew what that man was running from, you'd run with them. Matter of fact, you'd probably outrun them. And we've been so set up to think that this place is ours, and it's not. 
As a matter of fact, my father-in-law told me something about a year or so ago. He said, you know what a border is? It's just a line that man made. And the only way that man made it was because he was stronger than the other man that wanted to take it. What's a border? I don't think there's going to be any lines drawn in heaven to keep the Christians away from one another. <laughs> when you take a trip like this, the view changes to the, to the full truth. And so the Lord tells me, when you go down there, Someone is going to ask where I'm at, and you tell them that I'm right here, right now, working on their heart. So our team shows up, and I stand there, and the refugees all line up, and I hold the Bible in the air, and I begin to preach just a simple message. And before I'm even done, this woman with a handicapped daughter walks up and just stands right in front of me. Right in front of me. I'm like, wow, I've seen them come quick before, but I'm not even finished. And she had heard me say, for those that are wondering where God is, he sent me to tell you he's right here, right now. And so we'd offer a salvation call and a bunch of folks come to Jesus and an interpreter, which was Michelle Sink, and if you know, I'm going to tell you, man, uh, Sister Michelle was amazing at being a tool for the Lord to, to translate. And I call her over and, I, and have her translate, and the woman said this, when I woke up this morning, I looked around at the tense, handicapped daughter, people that lay out there for six months, three months, hoping that the Americans will let them across at the border. And she said, this morning I woke up and I asked God, where in the world are you in my life? <laughs> and when she heard that the Lord had told me to tell someone that, and she heard the answer that God is right here. She couldn't even hold her place any longer. That's hunger to know Jesus. Let's pray. Stand if you're able, please, church. Father, I'm grateful for the work that you've done in the lives of everyone that went on this team. And we've only been able to share a small percentage, just a small percentage of what you did. but I'm grateful that you did it. I pray that as we leave this house today, we'd be encouraged. That as we, as we leave this house today, we would be drawn into spending more personal time with you, understanding that this does not stop here. For everyone in this room, this does not stop here. We've got a local mission field right outside these doors where we live. We've got neighbors that need to be saved. We've got family members that need to be saved. There are strangers that we don't know that need to be saved. Right outside these doors. That's our job. That's our job. So Lord, I just pray your favor, your blessing, your anointing, on all of us here that you would give us the words to say let us know when to go when to hold still let us know what to pray let us know when to pray let us know how to pray God keep us hungry after you and may we stay in step with your Holy Spirit seeking you Father for all things seeking you for all things precious name in the blood of Jesus. Everybody said together, amen and amen. Stay right where you are. Keep playing for a minute. Um, you got that new baby with you? No? No? Um, come on, you two, come on up. Mom and dad, come on up. Just shoot. I thought I saw mom get up and go out earlier. No? 
just come on up here, Dad. Thought I saw her earlier. So I've got good news to share. Um, I got a text not too long ago. Um, what's it been a couple weeks now, maybe? Yeah, a couple weeks ago. Uh, that our brother has uh, had a new baby come into their life. Amen. 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 So we're just going to pray right now for dad, for mom, for the newborn child. Lord, we just, we lift up this baby to you right now. We lift up this family to you right now. Lord, we're grateful for him. We're grateful for him. Uh, Father, we just pray for health and blessing and favor and anointing all over them, Father God, that your will be done. Your will be done. Give them the strength it takes as there's a new addition in this home. New addition in this home. God, give them, give them the encouragement to encourage one another when nights get late or mornings come quick. Give them, give them the encouragement to love on each other. Seeking you first, Father, for all wisdom and for all knowledge as this family is growing together in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And we look forward, we look forward to as a family of believers meeting this little girl and being able to rejoice that all is well and that she's coming into this family of God. In Jesus' name and blood, everybody said together, church, amen, amen, and amen. Have a wonderful week. Love you, brother. God bless you, man. Yeah, as soon as they come, we're going to bring them together. Amen. I thought I saw her walking here with you. Amen. That's good. Let her know we pray.